to pattern my lager the top, I'm using the duct tape method. Beforehand, I make sure I wear a close fitting top, then I wrap myself in cling film. You may have to get somebody to help you when you do this. The cling film basically gives the tape something to stick to and so it doesn't stick to your body. Firstly, I usually tend to put a long strip of duct tape taut around my waist as I like that part to be really fitted. Now I take small patches of duct tape and cover myself with them. You can see I'm being quite selective with where I'm putting them. When you add the duct tape, just make sure that they kind of form to the curves of your body. So now with a sharpie I draw the pattern on, I draw a line right down the centre. We we'll only need to pattern one side for this because the other side will be symmetrical. By looking at reference photos, I mark out where the neckline should be. I also mark out the top shoulder seam. This is where the front meets the back. And then where the first part of the vest stops, where the chainmail is. The top is in two parts and there's also this smaller part at the bottom. So when I'm patterning this, I'm taking this into account also. I'm marking where the armhole is. And then looking at reference photos, I add in where her panels should be. And you can note I'm drawing the line right down because the top part and the bottom part should sort of line up panel wise. I sometimes find it helpful drawing small dots on and then joining them up once happy. I now mark out where the side of this top should be, keeping in mind that there'll be a small gap because it actually will tie at the sides, so the back of this vest and the front won't completely join up. To mark out the back of the top, you will need to get somebody to help you. If you ask them to put a centre line down the back and then look at the reference photo to roughly decide where those panels should be. There's the same amount of panels on the back as on the front. It's like they go over the shoulder and continue down. You'll also need them to mark in the back of the armhole. Before you cut this pattern off, you have to add these reference marks. It means that once the pattern's cut up, you can add these registration marks and then it means that when you put it all together, it should line up again. You can now cut yourself free by snipping it up the centre line. Be sure to not cut yourself or your clothing. Be especially careful around the neckline. So now you can pose with your really cool vest and then take it off. So because I had somebody else to do this at the back, I just want to double check it. So I put it on the mannequin and just double check I'm happy with all those lines. And as you can see, my husband did a great job. Before I cut these off, I am actually going to label them. And what you can do as well is take a photograph of how these all go together because it's quite easy to forget which one goes beside which one. So continue cutting those until you have all your panels cut out. Just remember to discard of that little central bit where the chainmail goes because we don't need that. So what I did next is actually transfer all of these patterns into a digital file. I've not included this in the tutorial because it does take an extra set of skills. However, I do sell this pattern, so you don't actually have to make the pattern. You can just go to my Etsy if you want to get that one. If you do want to use your own duct tape pattern without digitizing, you could potentially just take those duct tape patterns and transfer them straight to something like tracing paper, which you can then use for this next step. So after I digitized my pattern, I can then texture the leather. The reason I'm texturing it beforehand is because it looks that way basically in the reference photos, it looks a bit worn. So I've got a good trick to do that. The first thing you do is take your leather and you want to wet the leather with a damp cloth. When leather is wet or damp, it's a lot easier to shape it, so that's why you would wet the leather first. Next, grab some really coarse salt. I scatter them all over the leather and then roll a rolling pin right over them. The rolling pin adds enough pressure to leave little indents everywhere. And then what I do is I just take that salt and move it around the leather and just keep adding pressure around the whole of the material. I find salt is ideal as it has different shapes and sizes to make the indents more realistic. So afterwards, this is what we have and I'm very happy with that effect. You can then wipe off the salt and move on to transferring your pattern. I printed the digitized pattern onto card so that I had a solid edge to mark around. However, you could just print straight onto tracing paper, which you will see in the next step. It's a good idea to plan out all your pattern pieces to minimise waste and use as much of the leather as possible. Before transferring your pattern, you want to wet the leather again. You then take each pattern piece 
and go round it with some sort of scribe. Now I have this already and it's got a blunt end. It's not necessarily for leather, but it does the job. Traditionally, the tool you would use is called a marking awl. I continue this process for all the pattern pieces. Next, I print the pattern again, except this time directly onto tracing paper. This paper is so fine and transparent, making it ideal for indenting. I recommend wetting the pattern again and then taping it down in line with the outer lines you've already indented. To indent the pattern into the leather, for straight lines take a steel rule and use your scribe or your awl, whatever you're using, and just mark in those lines. So when I digitised my pattern, I also added in where all the punch marks are to be and the snake pattern. The snake pattern I designed based on reference photos and from making up a lot of it myself for the parts I couldn't see. To transfer any curves or especially the snake pattern, I just freehand it. So I'm just pressing in with this blunt edge to make a little indent into the leather. For any circular holes in the pattern that have to be punched out, I just add a dot. And for this S-shaped punch, I just kind of draw around the line that I've got there. This will help me to line up the punch when I go to punch these parts out later. So after we've transferred the first pattern, this is what it should look like. I continue this step around the whole of the pattern. Once complete, I have all my pattern pieces indented onto the leather. To cut the patterns out, I use a Stanley knife. And what you want to really make sure here is that the blade is very sharp. If it's not sharp, it's not going to cut through the leather in one pass. You can even test it on a scrap piece just to see. When you're cutting a line in the leather, it's best to try and not stop when you're cutting the line. So see when I do a big long curve, I'll just try and do that in one pass. If you stop, it sometimes can be obvious where you've stopped. You can see sometimes I'm moving my body around when I'm cutting. So let your body follow the movement and then you should get like the best kind of curve from that. Also remember when cutting to keep the knife at 90 degrees to the leather. Before moving on, I wet the leather again. I'm going to add a bevel around the snake pattern. So what I'm doing is using this smooth beveler tool. With this tool, you place the toe on the line that you want to bevel with the angled part facing out. You can then hit this with a mallet and that now adds a slope onto the outside of your marking. This makes these details much more prominent. When using the tool, you basically place it on the line and you can just continuously hit it with the mallet whilst moving the tool along that line. So you can see after doing a couple of lines, this is what it looks like and it's standing out a lot more. I continue doing this around all the lines. Always be sure to have the toe of the beveler facing you. So position the piece so that that happens. It's just a lot easier to do and you can see where you're, where you're hitting it. One thing I'll mention about this tool is it doesn't actually remove any material. All you're doing is pushing that leather down. So I bevel the next piece of leather. Note that when working on the bottom part of the vest, bevel first, then separate into panels before punching. Now after all these lines have been beveled, I move over to adding those S punches in. I have a special tool for this that's actually in the shape of an S. That's why I've designed it this way. And all you do is position the punch over the hole that you've marked out get a mallet and hit it down until that material is removed. You may have to hit it three or four times for this to happen. If you can't get hold of an S-shaped tool, you could potentially just add holes in, but use the markings I've got on my pattern as a guide. To punch the circular holes in my pattern, I use a rotary hole punch. This has different diameter sizes and you can turn it to the one you require. You've already got a dot that you've marked out. You just put the punch over that hole and punch through. Just always be sure to not be right at the edge of this leather because once you put a hole in the leather, you can't remove it. And the size of hole that I'm punching here is 2.5 millimeters. I'm going to use three millimeter flat lacing for the braiding, but I worked out that I can just get it through this size of hole. If you don't want to battle with this while you're making it, you're probably better punching a three millimeter hole. 
I just went for a smaller size so the hole was less noticeable. To dye the leather, I decided to airbrush on some leather dye in several colours. I airbrushed the dye because I feel you use less dye with similar results. This also helps avoid rub off from the dye, which I feel can happen when you oversaturate it with other methods. It also gives you very good control and avoids adding dye to the back, which would be sitting against Lagertha's shirt. For the first step of dyeing, I really wanted to change the tone of the base. So what I did was I mixed chocolate dye with some dye reducer. If you add dye reducer to the dye, it means that that colour becomes less pigmented. So when I spray it with my spray gun, it would be a lot lighter. So for this chocolate colour, I just go over the piece and I'm not trying to be too even. I actually want it to be quite uneven at bits because that's what her top looks like because it's had a lot of wear. So once I was happy with the base colour, I then applied the main colour. This colour is called Cordovan. I didn't use any dye reducer or anything like that. This is coming straight out of the bottle. I felt that Lagertha's top looked like a reddishy purpley brown and Cordovan is exactly that. Remember to also dye the sides. Once it had been dyed, it looked like this. Now comes the exciting part, which is where we can assemble this top. I felt it would be a good idea to make a quick guide showing the order to piece this together. And just to reiterate for the braiding, there's two that go from the back of the neck right down to the front. There's a separate braid straight down the front. The bottom of the front is one braided piece, then there's one whole braided piece going right down the back, and then obviously the bottom of the back is another braid. In order to do the braiding, I use 3mm flat lacing. I also use a two prong lacing needle. So before you start, take your needle, pry open the top and bottom part, put the end of your leather in and then squeeze together. The two prongs go through the leather and stop it falling out. Now the needle is ready and what I'm going to do is put it through the first hole at the top. Also note that I'm keeping the leather on the reel at the moment. I know roughly how much leather I need, but sometimes I'd go a little bit short or a little bit long. And this means I can actually like save some of the leather if need be. I will cut it at the end. So take the very end of your leather and stick it up away from the bit you're lacing. Then you want to put your needle around underneath that lacing and back. This creates a loop around that bit of leather. Now I'm going to put the lacing through the other piece of leather, however I'm going straight to the second hole. If you were to go to the first hole, it means that the leather pieces will be slightly out of alignment. Also when you're putting the leather through, just make sure it's not twisted. If you try and untwist it first and then pull it through. Now we're going through the back of the next hole. Now because of the technique you've just done, there'll be two pieces of leather crossing each other. And the next step is to take your needle, take it back over to the other side and just go through underneath those two bits of leather. You're not going through any holes at this point, you're just going through two pieces of leather straight. Remember to untangle any twisted leather. You want this to sit flat. So now we're going down to the next holes and we go through the top and then underneath both parts. And then it comes out through the other side. And now we just repeat the process, so we're going back up, finding the next X, two bits of leather that cross each other, go straight through, make sure it's not twisted, and then you're going back down, next two holes, through the X, and repeat, all the way down. You can see if we look at the back, the lacing should be straight like this. If it's going at an angle, it could be that you've not lined it up properly. So once you hit the bottom, just make sure the technique has been completed. So if you do get to this point, make sure you go back through the X to finish off that braid. Then you want to take it underneath and you're putting the leather through the loops on the back. Doing this means it's not likely to come out. Once you're happy, you can also cut the lacing from the reel and make sure you have enough to lace it underneath the top. Now there's a variation of the braid for when you're not braiding two parts together, but you're just braiding around the edge of one. Keep in mind that I actually removed this braiding after I did it, as I realized I could do one large bit of braiding from the back of the collar all the way down. So to start, like before, you take your laced needle and take it through from the back. You need to create a loop so that you've got two pieces of leather crossing behind. 
and then you go through the next loop from underneath. Put your needle through the X and then continue down to the next hole. Put it through the X again. Continue to the next hole. You do this all the way down. As before, you would just finish the edge of the leather by leaving it tight behind these loops. To lace the top together, I used 2mm lacing and all you do is go straight across each hole. It's very, very basic how to do that. Just make sure that each hole on the front that should be next to each other, there's a straight line of lacing holding that together. And you just finish that lacing the same way at the back as the braids. And to connect the collar to the vest, I use the flat lacing because that's how it looks in the design. For the chain mill, I decided to make it from scratch. This is so I could have much more control over the size, material, and also it was a lot cheaper. Before making the chain mill, you'll need an electric drill. The drill needs to be able to fit a 12mm dowel, and it also should have variable torque and speed settings. You want to set the speed to low and the torque to its highest. This will give you a lot of control while you're doing this process. You'll also need steel wire. This has a diameter of 1.5 millimeters, which was not too thick or too thin for the effect. We need something round to be able to turn the chainmail into the right shape. So I'm using a 12 millimeter dowel. I chose this size of dowel because once the wire is wrapped around it, it means the diameter of each piece of chain mail will be 15 millimeters, which is what I wanted. So on the dowel, you want to start by drilling a hole so you can fit the wire through it. You want to open the nozzle of the drill to its widest setting, put in the dowel and tighten. Now put the coil around the dowel. You put the coil around the dowel so you don't get any kinks when you're turning it. Trust me, doing it this way is a lot easier. I'm also using some large boxes to support the other side of the dowel. Take the very end of the wire and put it through the hole that you've made. Now you want to bend it so it doesn't come out. If there's anything sticking up on that little bit there, you will need to cut it off. You don't want to turn this and risk scratching yourself. You'll note I've decided to wear gloves while doing this. You do want to protect your hands because it can take a while to do this. Um, you're basically holding metal while it's turning. So just keep that in mind. To start, gently press the drill and make sure it's going the right way. You don't want it to be in the reverse direction. You want it to be going in the direction that follows the wire. So now I've started it off and I'm just gently holding the wire and letting it run through my fingers. It can sometimes take a couple of turns to get this rhythm on the go. When you're feeling more confident, you can up the speed of the drill. When I'm turning this, I'm very slowly moving my hand to the left. This will ensure it's always going to land in the correct place. If you feel you need to stop at any point, just do that. Grab the wire again and just continue. Sometimes you might get small gaps like this, but that's fine. The chain mill's always roughly going to end up the correct size. So if this happens and the coil gets a bit too close, you want to stop what you're doing and just move it out the way and separate that wire. Now I've turned quite a lot and I'm just going to cut that off there. You can see there was a little bit in the middle that I didn't get right, but that's fine. I will just discard of that bit. But everything else is very usable. To cut the wire, I take some bolt cutters. Now I can remove that excess wire and use it at a later date. Now you need to remove the wire from the dowel. So you'll need to cut it off at the very bottom. Now you should be able to pull it straight off of that dowel. Once we're finished, we've got a coil of wire with a 15 millimeter diameter. Now we need to separate the coil into individual pieces of chainmail. So you want to take the bolt cutters and make sure you've got a container underneath and you're just going to snip through two or three at a time. With this tool you can't cut many at the same time so I definitely would wear gloves as this can really tire out your hands. You can see when one is cut it looks like this. So continue cutting the chainmail and then we can move on to assembling the chainmail. So now you've cut all your rings and you'll probably notice that they're not closed. To open or close the rings, you don't want to pull them apart from each other. What you really want to do is split it back the way or forwards or vice versa as so. I'm using a set of jewellery pliers. Our first ring will look like this. It's a closed ring with no gaps. 
So the pattern in which I'm connecting the chain mail is called a 4-in-1 pattern. It's quite a standard pattern. So on the first closed ring, you want to take four rings and connect that around that ring. The four rings you're adding should not overlap in any way. They should only connect to the main closed ring in the centre. So once you're done, you'll end up with this. The way you want them to sit is so it's almost looking like one side's higher than the other. This side's higher here, and these sides are lower. What you don't want when you connect the chainmail to your armour is that it's round the wrong way. They should always be sweeping to the right or sweeping to the left. So I'm putting the pattern back to where it was originally, and then what I'm going to do is add on some rings. So basically between these two rings, I'm putting this ring underneath both of those and then closing that ring. Then onto that ring, I'm going to add two new rings and these are only connected to that new ring because obviously that new ring that was in the middle there should have four coming out of it. So now we've got more of a row forming and then all I can do is just continue that pattern. So I'm taking a new ring, putting it underneath these two rings and then closing it. If you want to go down the way with your pattern, it's the same idea. You just continue the pattern downwards. Now I actually find it a lot easier to build up the chainmail on a mannequin. I prefer it this way as it keeps the top row intact and makes it much easier to build the pattern down the way. I did this method for the whole of the top to add the chainmail to the middle of the vest, I actually did this from scratch. I simply just took flat 3mm lacing, laced it through each hole, but as I put it through the hole, I would then take a closed ring and drop that down onto the lacing. So you can see I've just hooked one on. I can then go underneath the next section and pull it through. Now it's attached to the top. I then move on to the next hole and add another bit of chainmail onto the lacing. I keep going through each hole with the lacing from the back to the front until I get to the end. And then what you can do is you can build up the chainmail pattern. So we're using the four in one pattern and I actually found this a lot easier to do because you've got it hanging down on a mannequin and you can just hook those rings straight onto the ones that are already there and build up your pattern. The middle part's actually the easiest part to do because it's just three straight lines of chainmail. Now moving on to the bottom of the top, we've got a few issues. The first issue is we're working on curves. The second issue is that we have a braid at the bottom. So I'm doing the double braid in the same way as before, except every time I put it through a new hole, I'm then taking a ring of chainmail and popping that down over the lace. We're still taking it through a hole, going back, going through the X and then going forward. It's the exact same method I've showed you before. Add a ring onto it, go through the back, pull it out, pull it back through the X, and then you continue the pattern on. When I got to the halfway point, this is what I had. I felt doing it this way meant it would be much easier to just hook the pattern straight on. So as always, once the braid is done, you want to lace it through the back. The difference with this is I actually laced it right past the halfway point. I did this on both sides and what that means is you can actually pull each section tighter because there was like small gaps appearing between them all because they didn't want to sit close together. So you can pull that lacing and pull the, pa the panels of the top just to remove any gaps. So this was the first idea I had for this pattern. I decided I wanted to start from scratch and build it up around this pattern. The problem with that is you can see how I've pulled the rings quite far apart. They're not actually meant to sit that far apart and at the time I didn't really realise that. They actually should overlap by quite a bit because chainmail is supposed to move with you. Um, it's not supposed to be so restrictive. So after doing that I found that the top of those sections were sitting where they should sit but the bottom parts were kind of angling in whereas they're supposed to hang straight down. So I actually took all that off again and I'm redoing it. 
I took some of the sections I'd already done and hooked them on to the straighter parts of the curve. So you can see I've got one section down the front and one section down the side. And then the section in between is the, was the problem area. You can see it's wider at the bottom and uh, more narrow at the top. Just keep following the same pattern. And I actually would more recommend starting from the bottom. That way, that's the largest gap. So once that's filled and it looks okay, then you can go back up and fill in that other space there. And I feel like that's a lot easier to do to get the desired result. Also, when hanging the rings, you can make use of pins and things like that just to keep them in place. As a note, the chainmail that goes on the arm is a rectangular shape of chainmail. To create this, I actually did it away from the vest, but for those top rings, I just hooked them on with the lace in the exact same way. So I could then hook on the rectangular piece of chainmail that I had created. So with the rivets, I got the proper tools that you need to install these. The first tool is a punch that makes the hole. So you need to make sure you've got a marking of where the hole is to go. Then take a mallet and just hit that onto the leather and that will create your hole. I complete this step for all of the rivet holes. All it does is simply remove material from the leather in the shape of a circle. So now I can install the rivets. The rivet has two sides. You put the base underneath the top and then the dome part on top of that. It can be a bit fiddly to match them up. Then we've got this little piece of metal that's got a curved shape inside. This needs to go underneath the back of the rivet. And then to join both parts together with a solid connection, we take this setter tool and actually that has a domed shape inside it that matches the head of the dome. You simply put that over the domed head of the rivet and then hit it with the mallet. Please be aware that if you're not using the exact same rivets as me, then there might be other ways that you need to actually install them. So check out the company that you're buying from and what special tools you need to use for that. You may want to add the rivets before this step. Obviously, I've completely laced the top up. The reason I waited so long is I took ages to actually find these rivets that I wanted. I managed to eventually find a shop in the UK that sells 5mm domed rivets. And the colour you want to get is antique brass. So I keep installing each rivet in this way until they're all installed. You can see there's ones at the shoulders, there's ones at the bottom of the top. If you're using my pattern, these are all marked out for you. Now there's two rivets at the front and I feel like you really need to make sure that you're installing these so that they're kind of even. I feel like the way that the leather gets braided together, it slightly shifts them out of alignment just so much. And if you want these two to look aligned because they're right next to each other, I recommend maybe using my pattern for one of them and then for the other one, I would just use a ruler or something like that to work out where they are aligned because it's a bit more noticeable if they're a couple of millimetres misaligned. The rivets I've added at the front are not exactly in the right place on each side, but I felt it looked better this way. That's the Lagertha vest now completed, and I hope you enjoyed the tutorial.